<laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm Mark Shelburne. I'm a lecturer here at the university, and I use the space as well, but I'm also involved in the running of the BIM hook. So we've gathered the people as a panel, and I think we'll, I think my role here is to just try and make sure that, that everybody's talking at once. So if I can ask you to put your hand up, explain who you are, and then ask the panel a particular question you've had from the presentations, and we'll go from there. So, yes, Chris Jay from MPS. Um, do you operate seasonal recommissioning? Well, that's probably for us and Nigel. I don't think we do, right? Nigel? Um, I think there was a requirement in this that contract. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the building's going to change as the seasons change, and you may find that affects your energy consumption enormously. Absolutely, and it's probably something as well to do in that first year, but then also to maybe do it fourth year, eighth year, carry on. And not so just it's obviously invest a huge thing. amount of capital in the building and the revenue costs are, I don't know what they are, but they're clearly not insignificant. And yeah. you know, to make a five, ten percent change by just reducing the season until you get the systems balanced yeah. uh, might bring some yeah. benefits. And one thing as well is about changing the use of the building as, as the years go on, because sometimes you might find that you use a space more often or less often than you thought. I mean, one thing which I, I'm not sure whether it was actually in the design at the beginning, but we it's 24-hour um, access. access in these buildings. I don't know if that was actually To, to the full it, building? Or? Yeah, to the full building, it's 24-hour access. So we don't necessarily heat it for 24 hours, we definitely don't, but they have access to it, and that's sort of one of the issues with um, using the project rooms in the evening. Um, Urging. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I, have, I, I have this lovely vision of your architecture students Ah. And that might explain your uh, energy consumption it might be. in the evenings. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm on the lookout for whenever I walk around. But I don't see as many here than I see at some of our other buildings. Um, I think they bring more sleeping bags. Yeah. Sorry, my other point, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you set aside a percentage of your budget to effectively modify the buildings and deal with some of the, you know, slightly you can see, you see these negative comments about, um, the, you know, some of the building services perhaps. And, um, you know, as, as a client, is that a way of addressing in the context of the capital investment how you may improve the building? Because if you have a sort of handover stock, we're not going to invest any more in the building. From a design point of view, you know, by definition, there will be things that need to be addressed. Every building has that. As a client, is that something that would be considered as a, you know, effectively not a maintenance fund, but a fund for addressing such issues that might require only a small amount of capital investment but it might give you some pretty good returns. I really like that idea. I don't yes. think we do that. We don't do that. We did with the photovoltaics because yeah. we it, that was a cost completion investment and I think it's, it's had an effect. So certainly yes, I think the university is looking for that but it's the, ba the balance of how much can we do to it and also there are all the priorities in a large campus like this. I think this is uh, what, what the conversation uh, just had been. Does the client actually develop uh, an EIR for the future projects? Any what? An EIR, like employee information requirements. So how, with the lessons you've learned from this, are the, how they, um, I'm trying to paraphrase it, how are they being used in future EIRs for yeah. future projects? Yeah, is that your question? Yeah, so since, since this project we've developed, um, both um, quite high-level design guides that uh, cover B and C and M and E and civils. We've also developed uh, detailed um, specifications. Where we struggle, to be honest, is maintaining those uh, <coughs> levels. So where a contract comes in over budget, actually, as a as a department, protecting our specification and our standards can be problematic. So there's, a, there's obviously the push of either reducing the scope or reducing the, uh, um, the specification. I try and say we should be reducing scope rather than specification or increasing the budget, but it's a difficult mm -hmm. discussion to be had with our management accountants. And then it's also the dreaded value engineering when we get closer to how much the building is going to yeah. cost. So yeah. I mean, the reality is with management, I, I hate that, that phrase because the reality is that uh, value engineering often is, isn't value engineering, it's, it's pure cost-cutting. Um, and so I, I have a, 
a love-hate relationship with the, the concept, to be honest. So, and it's difficult. It's very difficult for us to, um, once we've committed to a budget, to, to move from, mm. from that level of funding. Can I add something about, um, I think some things as well, when you get a lessons learned and then you go, ah, I know how to phrase that and I know how to instruct the design team to do it right this time. Other things, though, can sometimes just be like, and just they're all great in hindsight and actually you, you'd never have predicted that that's what the issue is going to be. So sometimes it's not so much, oh, I can't think of a great example now, but it might be those night vents. You know, we, the night vents work really, really well. There's just something slight about it that doesn't seem to be working well at, at particular times. So we wouldn't have ever put in an employee's requirement of not to do that, but it's more this soft landings element of saying, let's try and play through our minds all the different scenarios of what, uh, of how the building might be used and then maybe we'll pick up something and tweak a design. But one that was really easy was, for example, the metering. Now it's in the designs that we don't just install the meters, but we include in the project cost the connection of those onto our AMR and actually we'll log the data. So that's a, a, a quite a clear change that we've made. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, Austin, uh, based on your alcohol. So, it's all good. The, ele the electrical consumption is yeah. big, isn't it? So, over three years, it's essentially increased by 100% or whatever. Yeah. So, is that a result of how the building's being used in terms of utilisation? Any, any ideas on what's causing that? No, I haven't heard of much. We've, so, we've got, we've got that data. That's more like a high level snapshot. And what we can go down into more detail in terms of daily profiles, because I'll have a half hourly data on that so I can see whether it's the base load that's increased or whether peaks have increased. Haven't done that yet. But then what we wouldn't be able to do is to we've got no further submeter in that I've logged. But we can start looking at it. So your student numbers are increasing for the course that Yeah. I suppose student numbers will have increased marginally. Yeah. Might be something to do with 24 hour access. Yeah. I mean, if you express that as uh, carbons per uh, person, I'd be interested to see that. I would. That, that makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I guess there's no magic answer to why it's happening, but you know, student numbers are increasing, but I don't think as a reflection on, on, on that particular electricity price. Um, no, no, go on. I was going to move on. But space is utilisation, actually, because we can start to look at our room bookings. So we've got a room booking system. I'm not sure quite sure how they're locked, but that's something that we're looking at doing and making use of that data. If I know how many hours of bookable teaching time is going on in that room, then we can see how that's changed over three years. Yeah. You know, maybe in the staff spaces, you know, they're trying to get away from plugging in kettles and stuff in the rooms into serviced areas you know that maybe people are bringing in kettles and they are bringing you know you the first thing you do is plug your mobile phone in to charge it when you get into work you know and all that kind of activity that may have some imagine parents this, you know, in primary night, but i should imagine most of it's lighting or fan motors and things like that it's a high energy consumption that's going to imagine your small power of charging phones it'd be it could be negligible in the room negligible wouldn't it in terms of consumption it would be some motors lighting I'd be surprised, I mean, some of the schools we've worked at, it's been the ICT particularly at night. It's been drawing quite a lot of service as well, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, there could be an element of counterintuitiveness on the PVs. It may be that we've got a nice big screen that says how much power is being used for the PV. So people think, ah, oh, I can use any power I want in this building because it's all coming from the, the PVs. <laughs> Who knows? Certainly something we can work on too. Kevin, you have a question? Yes, I'm Kevin Bess. I'm a lecturer here as well. And the lecture theatre is cold sometimes, so I can, <laughs> I can confirm that. The question I've got is, it goes back to soft landings, I suppose, and what are the challenges that the universities faced in trying to retrospectively um, apply some soft landings principles um, to a model which wasn't necessarily designed to do that from the outside? I don't know who, who that would apply to. There have to be do problems. You, do, you mean it, do, you, do you mean apply it to, like, for example, the BIM model? Yeah, I mean, we talk, we talk about, you talk about energy and this, this cleaning and, and other occupation costs. You know, but the <coughs> original philosophy wasn't necessarily 
to manage those through the model, I guess. And that's, come, that's developed over time. Mm. I think there are elements that are quite soft landings. So there was um, a good amount of measurement done, for example, on the Brie outside. Um, there was a good amount of um, engagement with the stakeholders, and just getting that feedback, I think, has been really useful. Um, it could have been more structured. So the key principle of soft landings would be to set out very carefully up front, which we didn't do with this thing. Um, what are your targets and what energy consumption are we actively targeting? Um, but using principles is still really useful because you, know, you can still look at optimization of that building and we've got on some interesting discussions about energy usage already. So, so you can even, with buildings where you haven't applied it up front, you can still use gen you know, principles of review essentially to get some value from it. I mean, we're not, we're, on our current projects, we're now trying to develop both soft landings, BIM, and post occupational evaluation using the, the Hefke um, uh, model together. But it's early days for us to, know, to try and work out how they all interrelate, which bits we can take from soft landings, which bits are duplicated between the Hefke post occupational review. And then once we have got that in place, what that will mean in terms of implication of surveys and actually what we need to do to deliver the results and to, to collate those in, that, those results and then use it because at the moment it's, I think it's I think, uh, probably slightly ad hoc to be honest how how we collect that data. Mm. It says but that but it's helping us actually drive that, that agenda forward. Mm. Yeah, one of the key things about soft landing is obviously doing a post project evaluation, not just the occupancy. Is that how how is that being built into future projects? Future projects, say we're, we're developing the Hefke post occupation evaluation model, which actually is a longer term model than um, the Visra uh, yeah. uh, model. I say we're quite early on in the stage, but what we would hope is that we will be engaging more formally with the staff and with, uh, with students and facilities going forward than what we've done previously, because I think this is a first survey, as far as I'm aware, that we've done. Well, I think. On First, this building. the very first one is the Power Ashton yeah. um, exercise that you're doing with um, your Hubble Bash. Um, what we did for this, because in re reality this is not a post-occupancy evaluation as it is. It is a simulated exercise, so we can see the link of BIM with the soft landings and what really happens in the project process and how we can maybe make it work. So in one of the conversations that we had in there, so that we need, she's driving the soft landings, I'm driving the, the beam project, how we can make these work together. So we don't, we kind of, you not know, stepping on each other's path, but also combining efforts to get to a better place. Mm. I mean, I think in, in answer to the question of can you retrospectively carry out a soft landings, I think I don't know if you really can, because I think soft landings is actually all about you know, before you've done it, before you've handed over and landed in your building. So I think we, we are, we're not really doing a... Yeah, I don't think you really can retrospect soft landings. I think what you can do, though, is just analyse the building that you're occupying, the building that you're operating, using similar checklists, but that soft landings really does need to happen before you've done those final bits of detail design. Um, one thing that we're doing on some of our smaller projects, so when we're maybe do, doing a small moderation on a building, so not actually a refurbishment, we might just be changing the lighting control, we might just be upgrading some lighting fittings. I think there is a way that you can apply some simple and sort of shorter soft landings principles to any small change that you make in a building, because any small change actually can have an effect on how the users are moving around that space or how they are operating the lighting and cooling, for example. Um, but in terms of the big projects, like they've said, we've started to use soft landings on our major projects here at UWE, and the one with Eurohapel down at Bower Ashton is really our let's try and do it as best as we can type project and see what we can learn from it. And um, we're, we're introducing it at Reva stage, the old stage C, so it's quite early on, we're not trying to sort of get to like a, a yeah. full design and they say, right, how, how does it work? We're actually trying to embed it from, from 
the initial uh, design stages. Although I think when we got Bureau on, we'd already done quite a lot of the... Yeah, we'd done... I can't remember what stage it was. It was more like stage yes, D. It was a little bit late, but it was just about okay. early, early enough to just do... To, to still time to try and do it. But that's one of the big lessons learned as well, that brought it on slightly too late. But what, we've, what we do with Bureau Happle, so we've got... Um, Soft landing support in terms of facilitating and the engagement with us different stakeholders. A survey now, so we just did one, we just finished it about last month with the staff and students so that we can get a pre-snapshot and then we'll do another staff survey and student survey this time next year so we can see if there's been any change in their in satisfaction. Um, the project, by the way, is a refurbishment plus an extension. So it does mean that we can ask staff and students, how do you feel about the building now? And then it will get changed. And then how do you feel about the building now, um, when it's finished? So this is quite a good example of soft landings for us. Um, and we're also using Bureau ha Happled for, sure, this is 18 months, is it after? 18 months, yeah. Um, yeah, so 18 months after handover to use their service as well to help us see whether the building's operating as we expected. Um, we're also, as part of this work, um, doing an energy analysis, an energy prediction model so that we can get a breakdown of how we think the energy use is going to be in this building in terms of end use, energy. So all the different systems, cooling, heating, lighting, and including that unregulated energy. So trying to have a go at guessing what that unregulated plug-in loads are going to be. But we'll see how we get with it. And maybe we'll be here this time in two years and give you some different results and lessons learned. Okay. And another, sorry, another issue, sorry, no, it's in terms of we've got two projects running sort of simultaneously. So we've got the Bower Ashton that was a first uh, um, trial that proper soft landings and we've got the FPL that's just started which we're trying to embed into it and as there's quite a few QS's in the room and I think from the QS point of view what we'll be demanding from the QS is different than what we would previously have demanded them in the BIM world and that we, we're not looking for QS's now just to tell us how many how many meters squared of bricks there are and how much they're going to cost we'll be expecting them under the BIM world actually to be modeling various elements so that actually we can see post-occupation actually what are the life cycle of these costs what will it actually cost us and actually help us uh, influence the, the design solution which we haven't really had the control of previously so we're hoping that the BIM, the BIM world will actually aid us with this but I think for QS's I think they need to frankly raise their game and actually add, add, add a different added value from where they would where traditionally the industry has been. Thank you. As about, and you mentioned about the Kobe data drops between the design. Can you actually use those data in your uh, FM systems? Like, what has the FM system in place? Are you actually using the data drops? Or no, no. Those, uh, I think that was indicative, wasn't it? That was indicative, yes. but uh, on future projects with yes, the FBL, you are going to be going with to With new that. projects, yes. We are looking for data drops, but with that project, that was it was done quite stage. early. It was. Um, it was BIM stage in level one. I put those into the presentation just to understand the point in the design process that you have those data drops. Um, but moving forward with FPL, yes. that will be BIM level two. Yes, won't we it? have specified for the new FPL project that we want the data drops and when do we want them and what information do we want there. And we already set up some coding system to be able to work and be plugged directly onto the FM. For those that don't know, FBL stands for Faculty of Business and Law, so there's going to be a new building here for that. Uh, Peter, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm picked up, so I'm an energy environment here, so I'm sitting in the same system as these guys, trying to decide uh, trying to get buildings, buildings right to handle over, right? Uh, with the strides of all these buildings as well. Uh, a key a question for me, because the key part of soft landings, which I think you touched on, we've got some issues here, is this thing about intuitive controls intuitive lighting, heating, all those sorts of things, and users can understand them. Um, it's one of the things that we struggle with as well, and I guess it's a question to you guys, but also a question to the room. Um, who and who can we try and ensure that we get really intuitive controls 
because it's a, it's a, it's a combination of um, real technique and the details, um, but also then with a bit of psychology and something on the client side as well mm -hmm. to say how will people interact with these and what sort of people can do things on that. But it's, it's something that we, I think we all struggle with. We all end up with lots of light switches that aren't labeled and yeah. control systems that aren't good. And, and just to add to that, I think it's also important to remember those, whatever rules or principles as the sort of client you come up with to say, this is a intuitive control, to apply that across every project, whether it's a small one or a big major project, so that when the users, especially universities where we're, it's all transient users, it's different teachers in different lecture rooms, different all students coming in and out of different rooms, they all need to recognise, oh yes, that's the lighting control that's the, where the heating is controlled. If they walk into different spaces and it's all different types of switches they've got to try and work out what they do, then it's really confusing. And we've got so, I will say, we've got loads of examples of very strange buttons in rooms that I don't even know what they do. There's one that was brilliant, it's just this big button that says, I think, override. Oh, um, no, and it just yeah. it's one button do. Button. <laughs> Who's going to press that? Not even I would, would be and happy to And there's with the red, red uh, switches, switches at, at in Bower Ashton. So you get those uh, light switches, but they're red. So you're kind of afraid, do I do it or not? So it's that kind of messaging. Right, right, yeah. I mean, we all see examples of these, and you know, people like Rob love getting those up on yeah. the slides and saying, you know, yes. this is silly, but it's... It's, I find it's a really, really hard thing to actually get, and it's not always clear who in the, in the design process or the details of the installation is really responsible and the best place to be able to get it right. Absolutely. I don't know if you've got any thoughts. But, oh, so you see them worry, like the, when we are project uh, board meetings with the Bauer, Bauer mm -hmm. Ashton project, we get that conversation, how are we going to manage this, how, how are we going to make this, the users understand what do they have to do if they, if they get too hot or too cold, how, how are we going to approach this, so it's not an easy task just to get a group deciding on that and then are we going for signs stock on a wall whether we want to keep the space nice and neat, so it's that kind of thinking yeah. about every aspect about how we're going to manage that behaviour. So are you, are you in that thinking stage or are you in the stage of you know, trying to, I, know, I was going to say put pen to paper but we're living in a 3D world now, but you know, how, how are you? I think we have come with ideas, nothing has been decided yet. Um, the ideas come from the range of let the receptionist deal and the porters deal with this, so basically go and get help. Or get something on the screen when you're logged in and you can see I'm, at, I'm at too cold, I'm too hot, what do I do? So you can get, get that access through the server. In terms of the kind of trying to get it in at the design stage though, and try, in, instead of us looking around going, oh that one's rubbish, that one's rubbish, so we actually get a good user control in, I think we're still also at that sort of thinking stage of how is the best way of mm -hmm. us approaching it. And I think at the Bower Ashton project, that's one of our best chances at testing out a route for mm -hmm. this. I think one route is that really simple <coughs> phrase of just keeping it simple. Just keep it, if we can try and keep it simple, then that's going to be hopefully not too bad. <laughs> and um, the other one is keeping it. Um, same, so actually looking at what we've got in other places and if it works okay there, then replicate it again. So again, it's not something new to people. Um, and then the other one is using that guide, I think it is a BizReal guide, isn't it, of end user controls? Controls yeah, of end users? Or something. Yeah. Um, that's another, if there's something, if there's a new piece of controls we're trying to put in, then looking through that guide to check whether or not it sort of roughly fits in with that criteria. And so if we broadly follow that method for Bower Ashton, and then in a year's time we walk around and we notice really silly things that we've put in, then we probably need to rethink it. But Oh, sorry, the other one I was going to say is allowing time in the program for that decision on which one you're going to use, so that you haven't got five days to look at all the different light switches and go, yep, yeah, that one. You've just allowed the actual time to ask a range of people, maintenance, staff and a student, 
Yeah, and it's important that we also include, especially maintenance, so mm -hmm. we get that feedback directly from them. Yeah. And I think most, some of them, well, the majority of the negative comments really were the, the users not understanding how to override some of those mm. uh, systems when the BMS kicked in. You can manually turn off and, and close the dampers, but I think it's that education. Mm. And it's a bit of a balancing act because the last thing you want is a, a big sheet of paper on the wall, wall listing out yeah. all of those instructions. And are they going to read it? Yes, yeah. uh, it, it's sort of yeah. keeping it simple, isn't it? Yeah. But that, in a sense, isn't a negative comment, is it? It's a positive comment. Positive comments that they don't understand it. Yes. Yeah. So they're helping effectively inform you about yeah. actually no matter how you design it, if someone the person who maintains it doesn't know how to work it, it's, it has it's failed at its core, cool, hasn't it? Yes. So your point about establishing best practice is kind of well led with enough time to consider the options and emerging technology and things like that. Okay. Any so any final comments from the floor? Yes. Yeah, you can't hear last question. Um, we brought the RAP targets later for the design team last time. In my future project, what RAP targets did the design team think we can aspire to? Well, I mean, on the last project, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, maybe it was later in the day, but we had a 10% target and we managed to hit over 20, um, so maybe 20% or above. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is that something that should be led by? The point, or is it, is it something as you, as a designer, you ought to be doing anyway? I think it's a, a conversation to have with the university. I don't know if you you, you mentioned you'd potentially looking at upping your target. Yeah, your when, target. When, when we this is back in two thousand and eight when we introduced this, and that wrap target had only really, I think, just sort of been introduced by RAP, and we just really didn't know where the benchmark was. So what we didn't want to do is put in a figure that the design team just couldn't meet or one that was too easy. Um, reality is I think maybe it was a little bit too easy <laughs> as, it, as it happened, but there were, there were lots of dilemmas and I think Andrew said there was, there, was, um, there was conflict between the RAP target and the BREAM, Bream which we then had to go back to BREAM to say this is, this is crazy, we're trying to be sustainable and you're actually, uh, your, your, your uh, scoring system is, is working against us. So, um, so there are difficulties when you introduce these new uh, um, requirements, but I would suggest that we'll probably be looking at 20%, but I think we need to be looking at the form of the building, really. Mm -hmm. But I, I think those conflicts were worth noting because you know, some of the, the key elements to, to gain that recycled content, such as the cladding, was only a green guide rating of C, which is, is very low, and when you're trying to achieve a, a BREAM excellent rating, you should be looking at uh, the grade A components. So that was quite a, a conflict in the process. So I think any, any future target, you'd have to look at it against your BRIAM target, against, against some of the other goals you're aiming for on the project, I think. Just ditch BRIAM. <laughs> Good pass, pass. Are any of those standards mandatory on the funders? BRIAM or the right targets? No, no, they're not. So they're um, aspirational. It, yeah, I mean, they were aspirational for us, so I'm not quite sure. Where the planning is going at the moment, where other people will have a better feel for what the planners will have. Planning the future will, will, will restrict us. But as a university, what we're saying now is actually we aspire to um, achieve to the B, to, get, to achieve a BM rating, but we don't necessarily actually go through with the certification. Okay. If I can take close that chair's um, privilege, if you like, Andrew, you started with three key questions on your slide. Can I ask the panel whether you think that those three questions have been achieved in the project as a final kind of sum up of the so project? Is there been the, so the question is whereabouts, whether the um, project has been delivered as designed? Yes, I think it is. Mm -hmm. and so, it has been. so the project has been delivered as you thought it would be in terms of from a design perspective? Well, I wasn't working for you yet, but so. But I found that yes, and it's been successful. Okay. Yeah. The second question was, is it functioning now? Was this on, on Liz, Liz's yeah, slides? Yeah, on yeah, your yeah. Sorry, Liz's slide. Is it functioning as, as expected? So now that it's in use, yes. Is it well, the student and staff survey would suggest it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's but I from think their from perspective, but maybe not from the yeah. No, I think from a mechanical and electrical point of view, there are some systems which aren't functioning as expected. An example is 
but for the whole host of reasons as to why they're not, you know, work function is expected, um, yeah, they're not. But so I wouldn't say 100%. But from the user side, yes, but from us trying to maintain it. And yeah, but it. I have to make it, um, I just need, wanted to clarify that not necessarily is because of the design no. process, it could be also because of the client preparedness to specify how we wanted it to work. Yes, I think that's a fair yes, so, so it's not the design that has stopped it from functioning correctly, I think, it's just that for whatever reason. Yes, I think as you we as a client we need to get sharper onto where we're going and yeah. how the, we want things to work and yeah. it's for example the conversation yeah, that we had with Nigel and yourself that kind of is an eye opener and these opportunities to do exercises like this mm. is when we get to maybe have a sit down and talk about these things that because of the race to deliver mm. we sometimes don't do so I think it's yeah yeah it's been useful the final question was about how else could the building be improved? Yes. So are there ways that, that we can help? It, it sounded like some information for users on how to operate the building was a bit of a theme. Yes, I think as well, the, most of the issues were about uh, maybe, um, I think, us taking more control about how that kind of software or the sophistication of the systems it's kind of becoming an obstacle for us to overcome that, those situations. So it's whether we need to be more prepared or to include in the maintenance fees those changes that we need that to happen to just kind of fine tune the performance of the building, I think. Well, in terms of things, obviously, we've, we've already addressed. So we've talked about the PVs. For example, externally, we've originally had a, a resin bound material path that didn't really work for us, so that's that's gone. Um, so there are bits we have already addressed. It, I think it would be a case of doing these more surveys to try and understand things like the electric, mm -hmm. why the power has changed. I think the difficulty for, for papers, you've got you said on the on the on the screen that actually this is one of our better performing buildings. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the pressure will be to be looking at the ones yeah, this, that are, yeah. are bigger and, and worse. And mm -hmm. so, in the pecking order. It's going to be difficult, I think. Yeah. But on the, on the council side of that is, if you can learn lessons well from this building that is towards yeah. that end, yeah. you'd be able to apply yeah, them to exactly. what you're yeah. going to do with the building system. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time, and either by miracle we've actually, we're have actually 25 seconds early. So uh, can I ask you to thank the speakers and the panel for their participation and yourselves?